Welcome to this week's Holotube. We are very happy to have uh, Veronica Hubeni with us, uh, who will tell us about uh, holographic entanglement, in particular about covariant, recent covariant um, formulations thereof. Veronica, please, the stage is yours. Okay, thank you very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here, and thanks for everyone showing up later than the usual uh, time slot. So please do feel free to interrupt any time so we can run this as informally as you as you'd like. So this is this is based on a recent paper with Matt Hedrick that came out in the summer. And just to sort of preview the context, um, well, we all know uh, and love ADS CFT and its uses. So we have been able to make the information flow between the two dual descriptions go both ways. We can use you know, calculations in, in, on the gravity side to learn about the strongly coupled interacting many body systems. And uh, more, perhaps more recently, also use statements about field theories to learn about quantum gravity. But of course, that, that, that vision, the plan that has been there from the beginning of sort of understanding, let's say, quantum gravity, um, is uh, for, for, for that we need to understand the dictionary between the two sides sufficiently well. And the part of the dictionary that I'm particularly um, intrigued by or, or, or interested in is the emergence of the bulk uh, dynamical space time from the non gravitational degrees of freedom. So. I mean, at the shallowest level, you can ask what CFT quantities would give you the bulk metric, what would determine the dynamics directly, and you know how to lo recover local bulk operators and, and things like that. You can ask a more usefully, a more restricted type of question. For example, if you restrict temporarily, temporarily for at a single instant in time, what does that state in the CFT encode from the bulk uh, physics, or you can restrict spatially and say, well, suppose you just uh, know a spatial subregion of the full space on which the CFT lives, um, again, at some instant in time, how much of that uh, does, uh, does recover, uh, how much of the bulk does that know about? And of course, ultimately one wants to ask things about the strongly gravitational regime, like what happens how, how does the black hole formation and evaporation uh, happen? Uh, in particular, how is the information recovered um, from the black hole, uh, given that we expect that it's a unitary process because the CFT is unitary? And how does it resolve curvature singularities? You know, how do you see what happens to an observer that falls into the black hole and crashes into the singularity and so forth? And the growing expectation is that somehow the entanglement uh, structure or um, features play somehow a crucial role. So we want to ultimately understand what does ent entanglement have to do uh, concretely, you know, in building up the space time. How does how does that happen? What is the mechanism? So of course I don't need to review this here. Entanglement entropy. If you have a partition of a Hilbert space. Uh, into two subspaces, you can define the reduced density matrix by sort of ignoring everything in the complement um, and formulate the von Neumann entropy, which we call the entanglement entropy, as the uh, for, for for this reduced density matrix. Now, in a field theory, we have been uh, used to uh, separating uh, the subsystems into. Um, as delimited by spatial regions. Of course, that's not strictly speaking correct, but we, we know how to uh, deal with that. So I will ignore the subtlety and um, do the usual thing of you know, pretending I can define the entanglement entropy for a spatial subregion. Okay, it's, it's infinite, but that, that's okay. We know how to deal with that. And, but you might ask, stepping back from what you're already familiar with, uh, Entanglement entropy itself is pretty uh, subtle quantity. You know, it's, it's non-local, it's very intricate, it's you know, difficult to measure and calculate, especially in strongly coupled quantum systems. And so we have been trained 
uh, in the intervening decades to say, well, when something is hard and strongly coupled field theories, does ADS CFD come to the rescue? And a priori, you might have said, well, this is going to be tricky because the map, uh, the geometrical mapping between the boundary and the bulk is, is, is complicated. And entanglement entropy in itself is complicated. So this should be doubly complicated, the bulk dual of, 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 of entanglement entropy. And yet we know it's almost as simple as you might possibly imagine. It's described geometrically by sort of the most, you know, the, the, the simplest natural construct that contains information about how you're delimiting this region and what is the state. Okay, so that's something yet to be understood. I, I, I think we, 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 we know it works, we can prove it, but, but I think sort of understanding that a little bit better would give us hints about the ads -CFD dictionary that we can then build up on. Okay, so the, this brings me now finally to the motivation of, of my talk that, so one wants to sort of elucidate quantum gravity by holography, but one, to do that, one needs to understand the dictionary a little bit better. And in particular, one wants to understand what does, how does entanglement come in? How does it sort of underlie bulk emergence? So what is the structure of uh, entanglement? And in particular, since we, um, are, we have been focusing on entanglement entropy as a natural measure, uh, of entanglement that has the simple bulk description, uh, one can uh, try to utilize that. Now, there are very strange features about uh, the initial geometric description, which, which I'll, I'll review. So uh, what, what we'll do now is a very small step in this program, which is simply to reformulate the holographic entanglement entropy prescriptions still fully covariantly, but in different, slightly different pictures. Okay, with the hope that such a reformulation will contain new features that will then inspire understanding this map and ultimately the bulk emergence better. So I won't say anything more about bulk emergence. I'll now focus on the reformulations of the holographic entanglement entropy. Okay, so the key tool here is general covariance in the sense that if you want to define some meaningful quantity in the bulk geometrically, it had better not depend on any extra baggage, like you know, choice of coordinates and so forth. So the specific amount of specification in the bulk has to be the same as the amount of specification on the boundary. So of course, a covariantly well-defined quantity is, 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 is just required for, for anything to be physical. And of course, it's necessary um, to do this if you really want to ask about what happens in time-dependent um, you know, situations, say so measure entanglement entropy for some evolving system. But also the, the other advantage is it sort of a, provides a complementary toolkit in the following sense. You might, I mean, many of us like to um, you know, specify some, some, some quantity where you can compute it explicitly and see its behavior. Um, but unfortunately, you can do that only in sufficiently symmetric situations. So we can calculate all sorts of things about pure ADS3, but in pure ADS3, various different notions that are just conceptually different coincide, are degenerate because the geometry is so simple. It's like saying a line in flat space could be thought of as a geodesic or as intersection of two planes. Once you curve up the space, the two concepts are completely different. But if you all you knew was flat space, you wouldn't know the difference. Okay, so stepping back from situations where we can calculate and just asking for covariant constructs that are meaningful has this power of breaking the degeneracy that is typically there in situations where we can calculate things explicitly. Okay. And by doing that, I think we may get more insight because in particular, we haven't really included time uh, in much of the map in some full sense. We're used to understanding what's, what's happening at some instant in time, 
on the two sides, and we have developed a lot of technology with that. But time is inextricable from space in the in the full dynamic of space time. There is no natural notion of you know a time foliation of the space time, and so that feature we haven't really uh, I think utilized to its to its full extent. Okay, so that that was just the sort of the philosophy uh, that I'm taking. Okay, so now what I'll do in the talk first, I'll sort of review the the usual prescriptions that that we have in in in, in for entanglement entropy, and sort of talk a bit about what one would expect in covariantizing that, and and then sort of get to the technical part of the talk, which is which is explaining what is our toolkit and, and what are the actual results. Okay, so the proposal by Ryu and Takenagi from, uh, well, you know, it's going to be almost 25, uh, almost 20 years uh, in, in four years. So um, is, um, is uh, that if for static situations, uh, you can calculate the entanglement entropy of a given region in a given state uh, by taking the proper area of a minimal surface that's homologous to that region. So in particular, who's, which is anchored on this entangling surface. Uh, now this is all at constant time. So if you take a space-time picture of that, you first def you know, single out a constant time slice. That's fine when you have a static situations that geometrically well-defined because you have a time-like killing field. And so there's a well-defined notion uh, of, a, of a constant time slice based on that time, you know, time-like killing field. Okay, and within that uh, Riemannian geometry, then there's a well-defined notion of a globally minimal uh, co-dimension two surface. Okay, so this is a geometrically well-defined prescription, except when you have a meaningful constant time slice, meaning when you have a time-like killing field or when you have a time flip symmetric situation where you have a preferred constant time slice. In that case, it works just at that one instant. So in general, this is not well-defined. Constant time slice is, does not, is not well-defined for, uh, or is not uniquely specified in a generic time-dependent geometry. And moreover, minimal area is not well defined for Lorentzian geometry because you can always decrease the area by wiggling it in, in sort of the time like directions, you know, making it piecewise null would take the area to zero. So to covariantize, which we did immediately afterwards, it turns out that you can simply promote the minimal surface at constant time to an extremal surface that's homologous, still homologous to the boundary region. But you have decreased the amount of baggage you have to specify. It's just an extremal surface. Okay, so now this is well defined in arbitrary time dependent uh, situation uh, where you have asymptotically ADS space time. And uh, for this to be meaningful, calculate the entanglement entropy, it also has to satisfy the requisite uh, energy conditions, the null energy condition, the space time. Okay, so that's all well known and all ancient. Uh, what we want to do is uh, reformulate HRT uh, in some more useful way. Okay, oh, before I go there, I should say that, of course, the extremal surface very naturally provides a partitioning of the, of the bulk uh, that defines for us the entanglement wedge. So in the boundary, the entangling surface for partitions, the boundary space time into the domain of dependence of the specified region, the domain of dependence of its complement and the future and past. Okay, so those are four regions and they're precisely correspond to four regions that are delimited by the extremal surface. The one that's space-like separated from the extremal surface towards the original region A is precisely the entanglement wedge. And so that is the natural dual of the reduced density matrix corresponding to A. And then you have also the future and past of the extremal surface and the complementary uh, wedge. Okay, so um, if you want to reformulate the extremal surface, well, one way that we already did in the original paper was just to observe that you can think of this as a surface where you have vanishing expansion along uh, 
normal congruence, in particular null normal congruences have vanishing expansion. And so that means that if you follow this congruence, it constructs for you a light sheet, which played a uh, crucial role in, in, in Bousseau's covariant entropy uh, bound. So you can think of this as the extremal surface as surface which is admitting a light sheet that's sort of closest to the boundary. Uh, but you can also think of it in this Maximin formulation by Aaron Wall a few years later, where what you do sounds actually much more complicated. Um, it would be more complicated if you try to find the extremal surface, very impractical, but very useful for proof. So what you do is you first take any Cauchy slice, this contains the entangling surface. Now that provides for you a Riemannian geometry. So on that slice, there's a well-defined globally minimal uh, co-dimension two surface. And now you uh, maximize over all Cauchy slices. Okay, and that maximum of the minimal area surface gives you the entanglement entropy. So as I said, it's, it's, it looks like lots of extra baggage, but it implements this homology condition automatically because it's, it's the Cauchy surface specifies you know, the region between, between the uh, boundary region A and the, and, the, and the surface in question, the extremal surface. And it's very useful for uh, proofs because it retains the aspect. What was very nice in RT formulation is that we have this global minimality so for proving uh, things like uh, strong subadditivity, it almost follows immediately in sort of few lines. And that feature is lost when you say extremal surface, it's no longer globally minimal, but by separating out the construction of this extremal surface in two steps so separate, separately minimizing it on a spatial slice and then maximizing it by varying that slice temporarily, you can, uh, utilize this global minimality. Now you could of course do a opposite thing, which for some reason people haven't uh, discussed uh, previously in, in, in literature, but it's sort of very conceptually totally straightforward. You can first, you can formulate a, um, a time-like surface, co-dimension one time-like surface that again includes this entangling uh, surface. On a global time-like surface, you have a volume maximizing slice that's co-dimension one within that surface. So that would be again, co-dimension two in the space time. So that exists you know, for the same reason as a globally minimal surface exists in Lorentzian geometry. There's no way to sort of wiggle it uh, to you know, increase the area more. So there's a globally maximal uh, surface within a, let me call it a time sheet. And then you can minimize that area over all time sheets. Okay, so we'll, I'll show you uh, later in pictures how, how that works. And that will indeed crop up as one of our constructs, but just to say a priori, that's, you, can, you can do that too. And geometrically, they all boil down to uh, the extremal surface, okay modulo some assumptions about energy conditions and, 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 and so forth, which which I'll, I'll try to get to later. Please, the, hi. Yeah. yeah, hi. Uh, could, could, sorry, could you explain again what is the um, the middle, uh, the surface with zero null expansion? So that that work, that I didn't quite catch it. So you take a surface such that from that surface, when you shoot null congruence nor in normal direction, uh, the expansion along that null, null surface is zero, meaning its trace of the extrinsic curvature vanishes. So um, that happens to be extremal surface. If you wiggle it around locally, it's, it's a settle point of the area. Uh, uh, so it's, it's, it doesn't change area under first variations. Okay, so the condition of having zero uh, null expansions specifies a unique surface in the bulk. Not a unique one. I mean, there can be discrete, I mean, there can be multiple ones, but it's specific any, any, any surface with vanishing null expansions in, in all directions, well, in both directions, so automatically all four directions um, is, 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 is an extremal surface. 
mm. because it's it's an extremum of its area. It's okay. a useful way. Sometimes it's a useful way of formulating the geometrical restriction to in actually finding the surface, because you can you you know you, you might you might think that you know when, when if you're trying to find it, let's say numerically or something, at least in some small dimensionality, you might you might sort of try to formulate to minimize, let's say, the square of the some of the squares of the expansions or something like that. That um, you know, you, it's a local condition uh, that 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 you can then um, translate it in, in in this way. So that it's a it's a useful repackaging. It's also very useful. It's this this formulation is crucial in in, in various proofs as well because you know by Richard Hurry's equation that if you have a null energy condition, you start with zero expansion. The expansion cannot increase. So the that that now congruence has to be converging and therefore uh well it's that's that's what we call this this light sheet light sheet is is an all surface such that it has negative expansion along its null generators let's see that's a, oh good i didn't notice the chat before okay any other questions okay great Okay, so this was all the same surface, just reformulated differently. Let's now look at different formulations. Uh, good. Um, oh, well, okay. Let, let, let's say what's what's fishy about this. Or <laughs> not fishy, but what, what's what's uh, what, what what it leaves to be desired. Okay. First of all, it's it's it's. I always found it rather curious, and this is what actually motivated me to sort of what resulted in HRT. I was very skeptical by RT and thought that, well, by covariantizing, you show that it, it, it doesn't work. Instead, showed we, it does work. But what, what my misgiving from the very beginning was that from sort of a UVIR intuition, it seems sort of overlocalized in the sense that you're sort of sharply specifying. A, uh, boundary region, but then in the bulk, you, you might have thought that there's something fuzzed out correspondingly on, on the scale size of, of, of your you know, boundary region specification or something, but instead of being fuzzed out, it's a sharply defined surface. There's a set of sharply defined points in the bulk that corresponds to this quantity. I thought that was a bit strange um, you when know, grew to live with it, but um, um, so it, it, it's a feature that that's curious. It also, maybe more perturbingly, uh, the entanglement wedge can jump by arbitrarily large amounts under arbitrarily small deformations when you're near sort of phase transition. So suppose my boundary region isn't just a single, single connected region, but let's say in ADS3, this is the point correct disk, would com be composed of many intervals that cover just less than half of the boundary. Well, then the entanglement wedge for such a set of intervals would be the individual entanglement wedges of these intervals. But if you deform this to be, you know, slightly less than half, cover slightly less than half of the boundary, sorry, slightly more than half of the boundary, then suddenly uh, the set of uh, mini well, extremal surfaces would jump from being these ones to being the, the other ones that sort of now by homology are covering in this entire region rather than this tiny set of regions. Okay, so you can make this jump arbitrarily large by arbitrarily small deformation. Okay, again, that's not a problem, it's just a curiosity. Um, maybe even more problematically, the um, it doesn't, this prescription didn't quite elucidate the relation to quantum information. You know, what, what was special about the location of the surface? Does this mean that the information really somehow lives there in the bulk? Well, that would be fishy with these phase transitions. You might say, well, also a nicely defined quantity, the mutual information, which is just the total amount of correlation between two subsystems, is given in terms of entanglement entropies in this way, but the corresponding surfaces are all in different parts of the of the bulk. So that's also strange. Uh, you know, wh why are these specific surfaces corresponding 
to this mutual information and they all reach the boundary. Maybe it's not so natural to get a finite quantity from a bunch of surfaces whose individual areas are infinite. Um, so that's, that's also strange. The geometric proof of, of strong subadditivity, which is nothing but monotonicity of this mutual information under enlarging either of the systems, which makes sense because the total amount of correlation can decrease if you sort of enlarge either of the system. So that, that spirit of what the statement actually is saying is completely obscured in the geometric proof, which is nice, but doesn't sort of elucidate why, the, why that statement was true. Okay, so there's, there's various uh, uh, deficiencies in just thinking about surfaces. So we want to do better. And indeed, that what, what that was what motivated uh, Matt Hedrick and Mike Friedman to formulate uh, the holographic entanglement entropy in terms of bit threads. Again, only in static situations. So, in some sense, that the main co uh, component of our, our point of our uh, paper was to covariantize these bit threads. Okay, but in this static situation, in the Riemannian formulation, you can reformulate RT as follows. So you calculate the entanglement entropy of some subsystem as the maximum flux of a, um, of a field V uh, that is divergence free and of bounded norm. So you can think of the threads as the integral curves of this, of this uh, flow V uh, and the divergencelessness is just saying that the lines don't break in the bulk. They 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 start uh, on the boundary and go up to the um, some other part of the boundary, and that the norm bounces that they can't get arbitrarily close. So this is in Planck units, and so the maximum number of these threads that you can fit in that uh, go out of this region A that we're interested in will be restricted or will be determined by the bottleneck. And the bottleneck is the minimal area surface that's anchored on, uh, on this region A, on the entangling surface of this region A. And moreover, this in this uh, maximizing configuration of the flow, these flow lines will be maximally packed and perpendicular to the minimal surface. And so their number will be precisely corresponding to the area of this minimal surface. That's something that's captured by the max flow min cut theorem. And uh, I'll, I'll show you how that comes about a little bit later, but it's just an equivalence between uh, saying the something is computed by the minimal area of this bottleneck, uh, well, by, the, by the min cut area versus by the maximum flow that you can get out of the region. Okay, so that was a very nice reformulation for various re reasons. First of all, if you vary this region, of course, the flow configuration that maximizes the flow from that varied region changes, but you no longer have need to have the situation that you have these discontinuous jumps in the flow configuration. You still have discontinuous jumps in the bottlenecks, but not in the flow configuration. So maybe that looks a little bit more appealing. It automatically implements this homology constraint. So you don't have to, you don't have to specify it separately. You can define what's the maximum flow even without, even though the entanglement entropy is infinite, uh, you can define which out of you know flows with infinite, infinite uh, flux from A, you can still compare them by saying, well, can you add any more uh, of these threads to the configuration or not? Um, and because you formulate this as a you know convex program. You, it's, it's much easier, uh, computationally more efficient. And you might say it implements this quantum information sort of notion of entanglement maybe a little bit more naturally. You might envision something like, you know, this each thread is connecting an EPR pair that's straddling the entangling surface. Okay, it's not quite, that in the sense that if you change the region, the, the flow changes. So the EPR pairs um, are not, you know, all that that is that that would be separate from uh, describing the region. 
but at least it sort of has the spirit of you know some some correlation, some connection between what's in the region and what's what's outside of the region. Okay, so what we now want to do is to ask, well, how do you covariantize it? How do you formulate this in arbitrary uh, time dependent bulk space time without relying on this Riemannian geometry? So the Riemannian threads you can again think of as being at some instant in time, and you want to ask, well, so what? How, how does one think about the rest of the Lorentzian geometry? And there's sort of naively there's two very natural ways you might you might uplift this to the Lorentzian geometry from a spatial slice. One is to say, well, you just extend each of these threads in time to get something that I'll call flow sheets. Or you might, they might still remain one dimensional, but now no longer restricted to a single spatial slice, but maybe being able to meander in, um, in, 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 in the full space time. Okay, so if you extend them in time, the logic of that would be, or the, 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 the rationale, the naive reasoning for, for expecting that would be to say, well, if you have a EPR pair, it doesn't vanish instantly. It maybe, you know, it, the particles might move around, but you know, the entanglement between them is still still prevails. So the endpoints form word lines on the on the boundary, and therefore you might fill up these these word lines with the with a word sheet, okay, a flow sheet, or you know, instead of a bit thread, you have a bit cloth that's extended in some time-like direction. And you might say, well, that's not uh, that's not so outrageous because after all, for the spatial prescription, we had a um, Co-dimension one RT surface threaded one, one by one dimensional thread. And so if you uplift to the full Lorentzian geometry, you might say, well, now we have a co-dimension two HRT surface. So it should be threaded by a two-dimensional flow sheet. Okay, so because the counting seems to match more naturally. And so if you do that, the entanglement entropy should be somehow counting the number of these of these flow sheets that go through through this domain of dependence of A, subject to the corresponding norm bounds and divergencelessness that would reproduce the Riemannian case. Well, that's not so easy to do. And in fact, that's not the right prescription. One reason is that this norm bound, if you say that the flow sheets can't get too close together, well, you might worry that you'll expel them by say the whole space time crunching in the future, whereas that this, this entanglement in this region shouldn't know yet about what happens in, in, in the future. Okay, so it's sort of too global. Also, although we're used to the boundary space time being static, either Minkowski or Einstein static universes in this case, you might well consider um, non-static boundary metrics, you know, in asymptotically locally ADS space time, and then there would be no natural way of if you specify A to specify A at some later time, so evolving A of T. Okay, so that, that it, it it looks like that would be such a prescription would be very restricted because we don't know there shouldn't be a natural way to say well where does this entangling surface evolve to, and if even if you fix such an evolution, one would expect, so if you have a, say, uh, to, to make contrast with, say, string world sheet. String world sheet is a one plus one dimensional surface that well, however you slice it, you see snapshots being the strings, but the same world sheet would give you strings in for all the set of observers that you might have with different foliations of it. This wouldn't happen in with the extremal surfaces because the extremality is over constrained for different foliations. So you wouldn't even get a single you know, flow sheet doing the job for multiple observers who are boosted with respect to each other. So this doesn't seem to work. And in fact, in, in retrospect, it shouldn't have worked because entanglement entropy is really defined at a single instant in time. We're not thinking of it as evolving it. And in fact, if you had an EPR pair uh, in the strongly coupled uh, gauge theory, presumably it would immediately decohere with the environment and the entanglement would spread in some, in some way. 
So having a sharply defined uh, point on the boundary where that, that, that sort of localizes the EPR pair, you might expect anyway happens only at a single instant in time. And so you might think in some word lines on the boundary, just events. And so maybe you count the number of events where these EPR pairs can be localized, which is reminiscent of entanglement of distillation. You might think of the entanglement entropy as counting the number of such events where the where the EPR pairs can be can be localized. And so since on the boundary we have we really are thinking of events, well then the natural thing would be to just keep one dimensional threads that go from well, now you can uplift the region A to its full domain of dependence. So they go from domain of dependence somewhere else. It will turn out that they go to the complementary domain of dependence. And then you just count the number of such threads from this region. Okay, so that's a natural expectation that we, we just hand waved uh, towards. But now I'll show you uh, that that is in fact what, 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 what uh, happens how it happens and we'll be able to then answer sort of the more specific questions about how do these threads behave? Are they localized in certain space-time regions? Is how, how is their density bounded? Can there be time like somewhere and so forth? Okay, so that was all, <laughs> I spent most of the time, but that was all sort of meant to be the introductory part. So now I'll have to, uh, unless there are questions, let, let me pause for questions first. Okay, so let me now speed up through the um, through the um, setup and the toolkit, and so that I can try to get to the results uh, hopefully soon. Okay, so one one um, observation is if you wanted to make um, uh, entanglement entropy finite, uh, the extremal surface can't end on the boundary, but that happens for for example. Uh, if you have multiple boundary wormholes, the extremal surface is just not ending on the boundary and it's finite. Well, you can mock that up by in, in, in the standard cases with single boundary where you would have an extremal surface uh, going all the way to the boundary. You can imagine that this entangling surface is really spread out, has some buffer around it, um, and it regulates the entanglement entropy in the following sense. You can take the extremal surface only up to this, up to this buffer. So we think of this as the end of the world brain. It's an extremal surface for the com for this region A and its complement without this, without this extended enlarged entangling surface. Okay, so that's geometrically well defined. And then you take an extremal surface that's homologous. Re relative to this end of the world brain, homologous to the this region in question. Okay, so this is the construct known as the entanglement wedge cross section that was formulated by Dan Faulkner and already uh, commented that in, in in that paper that you can use it as a regulator for entanglement entropy. So that's a construct we'll use. And in the Lorentzian setting, then you can take the entire space time. Uh, to be uh, the relevant part of the entire space time to be just the domain of dependence of this of this region without without these buffers and so only up to this basically only within the entanglement wedge of this combined region a b okay so that's what what one one thing that we'll do uh, for simplification and later you can reinstate the full space time but it doesn't affect the prescription for the entanglement entropy the other thing we'll do is we'll relax the context of holography and go beyond holography in the following sense. We'll only require time-like pieces to the boundary. Uh, we'll, we'll require some you know, future and past infinity, this, this, this cry. And optionally, we can include also time-like pieces of these end of the world brains, uh, which won't participate, well, relative to which we can calculate the uh, the homology of these requisite extremal surfaces. Okay. So they won't create the end of the world brains don't source additional entanglement. The, the, the extremal surfaces will be free to slide around on them so as to uh, extremize their area, for example. Okay, but we won't, so the, the space-time is globally hyperbolic in the sense of uh, 
once you pose boundary conditions on these domains of dependence and you know nothing happens with these end of the world brains, you can evolve. So there's a notion of cautious lies, but we will in particular not require any energy conditions like the null energy condition or any dynamics like Einstein's equations for the bulk. Okay, so this is much more general context than actual holography because we're not requiring anything about the dynamics. We have just this kinematical structure. The advantage of that is we'll see what's special about holography. Um, and we, we have a more general prescription to start with. Okay, so ultimately we'll be talking about surfaces that, that co-dimension two surfaces that one can think of as intersections of co-dimension one spatial surface and co-dimension one time-like surface, which are, which are the cautious slice and the, what I'll call time sheets. Okay, so that's that's an ingredient in the construct. The final ingredient in the construct is that I, I can recast this, uh, well, I can utilize Lagrangian duality of a convex program. Um, let me actually, okay, let me speed up through this because I think I'm not going to get to the results otherwise. So you can ask me about it later or look at the slides or look at the paper. But basically the Lagrangian duality, the essence of it is when you have a convex program of minimizing some function subject to some constraints, you do it by introducing Lagrange multipliers for these constraints. And then the duality swaps the order of extremization between the, between the Lagrange multipliers and the original variables to recast it into a problem that now is instead of minimizing over the original variable is maximizing over the Lagrange multipliers. Okay, and those two, solutions agree subject to, um, which is called something called strong duality, subject to a condition that's going to be uh, satisfied in, in all our cases. Okay, and the max flow min cut, you can formulate or you can derive precisely by this Lagrangian duality where you start with the minimal surface, you formulate, you, you can think of the minimal surface as a step function, location of a step in a, say a scalar field, now, min cuts don't form a convex program, but you convex relax by thinking of any uh, scalar field with some boundary conditions that doesn't have a star sharp stick function, but just level sets. And now, uh, when writing the area of, 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 this, of this min cut, you can upgrade it in such a way that when you introduce the Lagrange multipliers for that solution to be well-defined, you pick up the constraints and the Lagrange multipliers give you these threads uh, with the conditions on them. Okay, so that, that's how you can derive the uh, max flow min cut. Okay, so what do we get? All right, so first of all, so let me start with the maximin, okay, where, which is, which is the thing I already mentioned that was that originally Aaron Wall had to reformulate it HRTS. So you have a, some co-dimension two surface and uh, you on some, uh, on some set, which is just a set of um, surfaces, um, which is lying within some uh, Cauchy slice and you extreme, so you take the minimal area on some Cauchy slice and maximize overall Cauchy slices. Okay. Now you can use within the Cauchy slice, you can use this Riemannian max flow min cut theorem to think of the minimal area cut as a maximum flow along that surface. And so that gives us what you might call a maximax. You can maximize over all Cauchy surfaces a maximum flow uh, on along the Cauchy slice uh, that, that goes from this region. And you can put the two variations on equal footing by instead of thinking of maximizing flow sort of within the uh, within the Cauchy slice and then just varying that you can think of that this this original surface as coming from the intersection of a Cauchy slice and, and this time sheet. Okay, so that that makes that's sort of nice uh, appealing because it sort of looks. Um, you know, the, 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 the Cauchy slices and the time sheets come on equal footing in some sense. Okay, and the co-dimension two surface 
uh, is just the intersection of them. Okay, so here's a prescription that's equivalent to the maximum. Now you might say, well, okay, so in the spirit of this Lagrangian duality, could we interchange the order? Okay, so I have written this as S minus, just suggestively not, not writing it as S because so far we're in broader context than holography, so I don't want to uh, associate this with entanglement entropy yet. And the subscript minus is because it's not a priori guaranteed to be the same as the quantity that happens if you swap these two. So that's a quantity I'll call X plus. And there I have swapped the or order of these extremizations. Okay, so we have in the previous one, oops, in the previous one, um, okay, uh, we had soup of inf. Now we have inf of soup of the area. Okay, so that's minimax, and you can write it on more sort of a footing uh, similar to the original maximin by taking the minimum over the maximal area surfaces within time sheets. Uh, and you might now apply the Lorentzian version of the now min flow max cut theorem that, that we uh, sort of discussed a few years ago on a, on a time sheet to convert the max volume maximizing cut into a minimum flux that you can do. That's now subject to a lower bound on, 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 on its norm. There's a subtlety with that, which has to do with whether you sort of take surfaces in the, in the timesheet that are achronal only within the surfaces, within the timesheets or within the entire bulk. So you have to be careful about that. But in fact, it turns out that in context of holography, you, 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 you can formulate this, but for, for general space times, you can't because there is this subtlety. But in any case, we have these two prescriptions and you can ask what's the relation between them. Okay, so I have to tell you a little bit about minimax theory. Okay, suppose you have a function on uh, some domain where of, of two variables and you want to ask what's the difference between swapping the order of extremization. Suppose you, you, you can maximize uh, in X first, uh, well, minimize in Y first and maximize in X or, or the other way around. Well, it's not necessarily equal in general. Here's a simple example of just a function of, a, of on the binary uh, that gives you different values as you can sort of check in your head. But what is true in general is that there's always a relation between them that the maximin is always smaller than the minimax. In fairy tale language, you can you can have a mnemonic that, for example, the uh, the largest dwarf is still smaller than the smallest giant, or something like that. Then it's completely obvious that <laughs> that the inequality goes this way. And uh, you can ask, well, when when are the two? When do the two coincide? Well, first of all, they coincide if you have a global settle point, a set of values x not and y not, such that this extremization over y is, is, is giving you this y naught and this, well, this minimization over y gives you y naught and this maximization over x gives you the x naught. But more generally, uh, there's a theorem that says that when, you, when these are convex uh, subsets and f is concave convex, meaning it's concave in x and convex in y like this, uh, then uh, that suffices for this inequality to be saturated, for minimax and maximum to equal. Now, in a space-time situation, beyond holography, it turns out you can indeed find examples where the maximum and minimax are not the same. Here's an example. Suppose you have a space-time where, which is uh, a product of just uh, two one plus one dimensional space and a sphere, the sphere having area A minus in these light regions and A plus in this stripe, that's sort of time-like, such that any spatial slice, any Cauchy slice uh, has to, well, cannot be entirely within this A plus region. Okay, so it's minimum on any Cauchy slice has A minus. And any time sheet has to pass through the stripe, so the maximum has to be A plus, and therefore, the maximum is A minus, max, minimax is A plus, and the two don't coincide. 
Uh, but the space-time does not satisfy the null energy condition. And it will turn out that if it does satisfy the null energy condition, in fact, minimax is maximum. Okay, so this was just an illustration that beyond holographic, you do really have these two distinct values. And already you can notice that if this bottom part wasn't back to being smaller, but rather larger than the A plus, then let's say I call it a B for bottom, then you can again see in your head that the two values would coincide even without satisfying the null energy condition. Okay, so it's 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 um, interesting to then ask, well, okay, so what? Did, how do we get minimax is maximin uh, without holography? Well, we use the other part of the theorem of convex relaxing. Okay, so now we want to convex relax. And so instead of having a sharp surface, co-dimension two surface, we want to so somehow fuzz that out. And we fuzz that out by doing the same thing we did for what I sketched for the RT uh, max flow min cut, uh, giving you the Riemannian bit threads, but now you convex relax in both directions. You take a Cauchy slice and still smear it out by thinking of a Cauchy slice as generalization of level sets of a scalar field that has some value in the past, let's say minus half and some value in the future, let's say plus half, and whose gradient is everywhere uh, future directed causal uh, one form. Okay, so this symbol J plus will be this uh, it will be a symbol for this being future directed causal. Um, and you smear the time sheet by again taking a scalar field now with a spatial gradient that's that's fixed to be, or large, at least some spatial gradient that's fixed to be minus half on one side and plus half on the other side. Okay, so that's a convex relaxation. What we now need to do is to have a quantity that we can write as a convex program that generalizes this, this, this area. Okay, that comes, again, that's a technical part, so I'm not going to spend time on it, but you can generalize um, the, the, the area by formulating what we call the wedge dot. It's just the maximum of the wedge and the, and the norm of the wedge product and the dot product. And it turns out, so in terms of area, it's, it is the area, if the timesheet is time-like or null, but it's, it's modified if it's space-like, okay? But it's something that allows us to formulate this convex program. So now this function f that generalizes the area, you defines for us this convex relaxed quantity, the C stands for the convex, for which it's now guaranteed that the maximin is the minimax. Okay, so now we can formulate this quantity, the convex relax one in either way. And it must lie between the original minimum, the non-convex relax values, because we convex relax, we're going towards the coinciding limit. And okay, so this is still a bit obscure. So we want to sort of make more geometrical sense of this. So we can Lagrange dualize, but we can Lagrange dualize on either either of these fields or both if we want. Okay, and by which way we Lagrange dualize gives us these different ways of having the different prescriptions, different covariant formulas for the entanglement entropy. Okay, so one way of dualizing, we dualize on this, on this psi field that, 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 that was the thing that sort of spread out the, um, was 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 giving spreading out the sort of the spatial slices and that's the so-called v flow program that covariantizes the original bit threads but you can do the other thing of sort of dualizing on the field that sort of spread out the Cauchy slice uh, to get a flow field that's now not spatial but temporal that's what we call a u flow program okay so what are these well this quantity then can be written as the maximum over these V-flows uh, from the domain of dependence or equivalently as the minimum of a U-flow uh, from between in, in the space-time between past and future infinity subject to constraints. What are these constraints? Well, for the V-flow side, well, for both of them, they're still divergence-less and they are restricted to be, well, for the U-flow, 
uh, it's, 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 sorry, for the V flow, it's going from the domain of dependence of A into its complement. And for the U flow, it's going from scry minus to scry plus, or anyway, avoiding the, uh, the end of the world brain and the, and the two, the, the boundary regions A and its complement. Such that, okay, so that was, that was just the, the boundary condition. Now, what happens to the norm bound? Well, the norm bound is implemented by sort of the other uh, scalar field that we haven't dualized on. And it's saying that this, in this case, this V flow has to be, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's typically spatial, but it can't be too spatial, too, too, too big, because this gradient of the, of the scalar field that smeared out the Cauchy slices, that's time-like, plus or minus that, uh, thing still has to be future directed uh, causal. And similarly here, the U is the causal thing, but even when we add the gradient of the smearing out these, these time sheets, so something that's spatial, it still has to remain future directed causal. A little bit more intuitively, you can recast these uh, norm bounds into something that's more akin to what we had before, the norm bound on the V flow is saying that if you take any time-like curve in the bulk and you project perpendicularly uh, this, this V flow onto that curve, the integrated norm, integrated with respect to the proper time along that curve has to be bounded by one. So it's like, if you're an observer, you carry a unit area window, no matter how you take it, uh, it it cannot collect more, more than one uh, flux through its entire lifetime. Okay, so that's that uh, generalizes the norm bound on the bit threads. Here it's similar, but now you take a spatial curve from A to its from domain of dependence of A to its complement, and now the norm bound goes the other way. The projected uh, U flow onto that curve has to have at least one norm. So it's like you're separating, you need to separate the regions uh, sufficiently. Okay. Oh, thank Veronica, you. Veronica, five minutes. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I just saw the chat. Thank you. Um, okay, good. So that's the, that's the prescription. So now we have these two prescriptions and you can, once you have these flows, you can also promote them to threads, which are just one dimensional. You can think of them as one dimensional uh, unoriented curves. You could have thought of them as integral curves of these fields, but actually you can even generalize that. And you can then formulate uh, a measure on the set of such curves. And you can write the convex program where you maximize this measure subject to some, uh, some bound or minimize the measure subject to some bound. And that corresponds to the to V threads and the U threads. The interesting things about that, so I'm going through this very quickly because the five minutes yeah, I, I won't, wanted to say for the uh, for the summary, but but basically the, 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 the highlights of this is that these density bounds are non-local, but they also reinforce each other. Somehow the, the, the threads, the, the youth threads sort of form a, in some sense, a barrier that separates the boundary regions. And the V threads, those are the things that covariantize the original bit threads, they, they, they connect the two regions. Okay, now in context of holography, things become very interesting. So in this beyond holography generic system, we had these three different quantities and they were, they were just bounding each other but did not coincide. But in context of holography, all of them coincide and all of them become the extremal surface area, the HRT prescription. So all of the formulas I have been showing you actually give us a covariant prescription for HRT. And how does that happen? Well, it comes from imposing the null energy condition on the space time and the fact that well, a ADS boundary condition where you have no gener null generators coming from the end of the world brain. And the proof of that is actually pretty simple. Uh, the HRT surface has to be uh, maximizes the area within within the entanglement horizon, which is the which is the set of light sheets coming from the extremal surface, because as we said, they had zero expansion to start with, and therefore the areas shrink as you go up along the congruence. 
Now that entangling horizon is a form of timesheet. So here we have a globally maximizing surface on a timesheet. Simultaneously, it's an area minimizing surface in a maximum slice. And so it forms a global settle point. And so in fact, we see that these, these three values, these two values coincide, they are the extremal surface. And so the thing that was in, in between gets sandwiched in the middle, so all of them have to coincide. Okay, there's another way to show it, but let me skip that. Um, now, in this context, what are the optimal flows? Well, the, the flows generically are very floppy, but they're fixed at the bottleneck. How does it happen here? Well, it, they again do get fixed at the bottleneck in this very nice way. So the V flows are these green, it's just as a generic optimizing situation, they can be floppy here, but they all have to squeeze through the HRT surface. They cannot penetrate to the future and pass of the HRT surface, but they can penetrate everywhere inside the entanglement wedge of the region A and its complement. On the other hand, the U flows also squeeze through the HRT surface and they're floppy elsewhere, but they have to remain in the future and past of this. They have to avoid the entanglement wedges. And so even though we haven't put in the location of the HRT surface or the entanglement wedge, it comes out from the prescription for any optimizing flow. So that sort of reconstructs for us the geometrical prescription without ever putting in anything about extremal surfaces. And if you go back to the full space time, this would be the more general picture in the full space time. Okay, so let me quickly summarize. So we had all these different prescriptions that all in the holographic context all give us a prescription for the entanglement entropy of, of a given region. And there were these various relations between them and the various dualities and converting from you know, flows to threads and, 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 and so forth. Um, now, what are the lessons? Well, the, this was quite a good, you know, powerful technique to generate such reformulations. And it, it, it gives a more pictorial way or conceptual way maybe of thinking of this, of, of entanglement entropy. You, you know, you might be tempted to think of these V threads that localize, that went from events in D of A to, to those in the complement as maybe capturing something about entanglement distillation processes. And conversely, the use threads you might think of, you know, as entanglement of formation um, in some very rough sense. I mean, this is extremely hand waving, but it's a, it's a first step towards formulating something that's more suggestive. Um, it, these geometrical quantities like HRT surface and entanglement wedge, which we didn't put in, now emerge very naturally in the holographic context. And of course, it, in the technical level, it's kind of nice because the dependence of how you specify the region switches between the thing that you're extremizing and the constraints uh, between the U and V flow. So the role that the specification of the region plays is different. That might be an advantage when you're trying to recast the various proofs of various statements, because now the, 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 the reasoning for things shifts around and it might be that one is much more convenient for some things than, than, than others. And of course, this renders uh, computing the entanglement entropy a bit more convenient because we have these convex programs that, that, that we, can, we can then use. Now, for the holographic space times, again, there was this nice simplification. And it's quite nice to see that, uh, well, so HRT surface was a global settle point. That's what we used in the proof for, for, for coinciding. But the way that I formulated it in this U flow and V flow, we, we, we used convex relaxation. So HRT surface already uh, doesn't have to be convex relaxed. Um, so it's, it's a sharply defined thing, but uh, these convex relaxed expressions, which, which you might think is less restrictive, retain the same feature because in these optimized flows, you did have this collimation. And of course, I gave you uh, just a specified context, but you can sort of extend, uh, extend this in various ways. You know, you might, we already saw how to embed this 
how to remove the regulator and embed the structure into full space time. You can, you can formulate the prescription for multiple regions. Uh, you can sort of use the minimax formulation to prove the holographic entropy inequalities and, and so forth. So this is, this is something that's working progress uh, with Guillermo Grimaldi and Brianna Gradowite and Matt Hedrick. Um, uh, you can then ask what, how do you uplift this for, you know, quantum and stringy corrections? How do you, how do you then use, for example, apply to tensor networks where you might bring in uh, somehow, how, how does time figure in uh, uh, and, and, and so forth? How do you, you know, can you generalize further and, and, and so forth? Okay, so it's, oh, this is just a, a throwaway uh, remark that you know our, our progress over the last century has sort of been culminating and we, we, we're hoping that you know one will learn about what is space-time how does it emerge we have we're not there yet but given how the fast progress in the last few years we might not be so so far okay so that's that's it thank you Thank you very much, Veronica, for this very nice talk. Uh, thanks especially for taking the time to, to give a broad introduction. Um, much appreciated. So are there questions? I see one question in the chat. Oh, sorry, I, I should look at the chat. How to reconstruct the bulk metric from the set of error threat configurations? Good. So, um, so this is actually harder than reconstructing the metric from, um, like, knowing the um, entanglement by the extremal surface prescription because the threats are floppy. So, just to back up, you you can certainly um, what what you can do is you can reconstruct if you know the set of entanglement entropies for a family of regions. That means you know areas of extremal surfaces anchored on, on that family of regions, so family of extremal surfaces, and knowing where in the bulk the extremal surfaces, uh, but knowing the areas and their nesting, you can, you can bootstrap this to figure out what must have been the bulk metric to give you that family of extremal surfaces. So that has been implemented early on for symmetric situations, but I think you, you, you can you should be able to do this in general um, as long as the extremal surfaces can actually penetrate uh, to the region uh, whose uh, metric you're trying to extract. Now for the for the threads, this is more tricky because oops, let me go back to some picture. Uh, the, the threads are sort of very floppy here. Actually, I might go back to some even the Riemannian case, which was here. Okay, so the, the threads are floppy everywhere here. And if you want to ask, how does, uh, how does one, um, well, uh, how does one read off even some single geometrical uh, quantity with definiteness, you would need to know somehow the set of, sufficient set of all of, sufficient set of the, flow configuration that would uh, that would give you this, this surface. For example, if the area, if the density was different from one everywhere except for the surface and one just on that surface, then that would be tantamount to using the, the using the, this is an extremal surface. Okay, so you can do it indirectly that way, but it doesn't seem to give you something better than the extremal surface. Okay, so that that's, I, I hope that has that has been a long answer, but um, is that are you happy e with the answer? E Igor was the one. Okay, he says thank you, uh, Martin. Okay. I know you were next in line. However, it looks like uh, Victoria had a question that is, uh, seems directly related, if I understand it correctly. Uh, I think she's asking about the Desita uh, version of Igor's question. So how to yeah, construct. That's... Bulk metric for the Desita case. Good. Well, that's even more murky, right? Because we don't have a notion of, I mean, already, you know, the HRT, which I don't think I would associate with name with from the is is murky in the Desita context. Uh, we don't have a theory, autonomous theory that's dual to 
you know, quantum gravity in this sector, which has entanglement entropy and so forth. So it's it's not clear how much all the interesting work that has been done in this in this in this direction, how much of it inheriting the features from the actual holographic context is you know going to survive and how much isn't. Now, superficially, you know, if you're just doing the geometry, okay, there are many similarities that that remain. But I'm not really sure one should think of this as, you know, you're learning something about entanglement and growth. I mean, maybe I'm too conservative here, but uh, um, now you can ask, well, again, but, but the same set of statements would apply. If you know, I mean, the basic point is if you have a family of extremal surfaces uh, that you have a sufficient control over, you want to invert uh, that knowledge to what would the bulk metric have been in order to generate that family. So if you can sneak up from on it from some well-defined you know, asymptopia where you know what the surfaces look like and then see perturbatively how they have to deform to, how the metric has to deform to accommodate the specific family, then you can do it in whichever geometry. It just, here I think it's uh, on shakier and shakier footing. Okay. Um, um, you see, Veronica, you see Victoria's so, uh, statements okay. in, the, in the chat. She she wrote so, last. So let's see. I asked Witten and he assumed that uh, maybe we could have the same entanglement for DS2. But then you can ask him how he thinks about <laughs> extracting. Uh, um, how but to do again, it? Okay. So, so geometrically, you can do many of these geometric things just. Uh, Uplift. So, so what, what do you need? As I said, what, what, what you need is you know, the, the reconstruction that I specified only cares about do you have well defined starting point to sneak up on a family of surfaces? Once you do, you do you have a measure of what these surfaces say, say, say their area that you can extract from the jewel. Okay, so if you assume you do, well, then you can run run that same procedure. It didn't care about being in ADS. It's just that, do you have the starting point and do you have a meaningful quantity in the jewel? Or do you have the jewel in the first place to give meaning to these, uh, to these extremal surfaces? If you do, or if you just want to say the exercise, here is a family of extremal surfaces, can I extract the bulk metric? Then that I think behaves the same way as in the ADS context. Okay. Um, I think uh, Martin was the next in line and then Juan. Okay. Yeah, I've got a technical question and non-technical question. Let's start with the technical one. Uh, where you uh, constructed this U flows and this V flows, you said that this Psi is uh, basically uh, constrained on the two boundaries where it takes these values of one half and minus one half. Um, but it's deep Psi is not really, um, it's not really constrained. However, later you say that u plus minus d psi is future directed and causal. C can you give me a simple argument why this is the case, or is it is there an intuitive argument? Um. So. Okay. So what do you want to do? Maybe. Okay. Let's see. I have I have an appendix that sort of goes through this a little bit more slowly. Um, I think I have an appendix. Let's see. It's not here. Um, yeah, let's go through the reflow. Um, okay, so so this uh, e, 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 the, the the field. So so what we have done is we have relaxed uh, this field, and um, we want to we want to keep. Um, but maybe, okay, let's see. Let, 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 I, I, I'm now realizing maybe I'm not going to answer precisely what you asked. Can, can, you, can you actually re-ask a little bit or re-ask once more so that I... Yeah, so I thought this Psi, psi was constrained just in the two boundaries to be minus one half and plus one half or, but there was no constraint on deep Psi, if I remember correctly. Oh, good, good, good. But they, okay, so so they constrain, they constrain sort of each other. So maybe the best picture for me to to use is the one with the with the this this one. 
Okay, so 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 indeed, so so you 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 smear out. So in the in the symmetric formulation, you have smeared out the Cauchy slices by a field uh, phi that was constrained to be minus one half and one half, and you have smeared out the time sheets um, by this field psi that was constrained to be minus one half and one half. Yeah. Now, here, I mean, in the picture, the gradient here is just future directed uh, uh, time-like and here it's space-like. Yes. Um, so, however, you might imagine, uh, you might imagine wiggling these level sets around such that the causal structure of them changes. Now here that's okay. So in fact, you can get, you can get the gradient of this psi field, the deep psi being time-like, yeah. In, directed in either way. The reason that you cannot get this one being space-like in either way is that now when you're doing these constraints in the in the uh, dualization, you have d phi plus or minus something has to be future directed. And so that means the average of them has to be future directed. And so the d phi itself has to has to remain future directed. Whereas here, you know, the ordering of these things is different. So here the deep psi itself can be future directed or, uh, sorry, can be time-like or space-like. Mm -hmm. It just imposes once you fix. So it's 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 not that you're implement, you, you, these are two separate formulations. Okay. Two separate yeah. dualization. So what's applying here is not what's meant to be applying here simultaneously. It's just a dual formulation of, of the, of the prescription. I just yeah. put them on the same page to, to save time, but you, you should really think of choosing one or the other or doing the symmetrized thing. Okay, thanks. And my non-technical question was, do you think that beyond the large N limit, like those prescriptions also are the same or can we distinguish them by looking at quantum corrections and like finding out what is then the true, uh, the true uh, prescription to compute entanglement into perfect. I look at an expansion Newton constant, for example. Ah, good. Um, well, I, okay, good. Um, well, so let me. Well, in the remark, I, well, I would say they had better be the same, <laughs> but we don't really have much of a handle on how to go beyond those. I mean. To, to, to finite n and so forth. So, so the picture for the bit threads was roughly speaking that as you, if you want to realize, if you want to take into account quantum effects, so, you know, go away from the large n limit or, or expand in one over n, then I think uh, it's like um, you relax the divergencelessness condition and so you might, you might think of the threads as ending somewhere in the bulk. Really what you might be thinking of is maybe you, 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 they're, they're going through some microscopic wormholes uh, that join up different pieces of the bulk. On the other hand, if you want to do stringy corrections, I think what, what happens is that you're relaxing the norm bound a little bit of allowing different numbers of the threads you know, through, through the regions. Now here, the in the in the covariantized case, uh, the norm bound becomes non-local, and so I think these two features will interface uh, much more. And I think it's a very interesting question of what 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 will happen, how to formulate this, and we haven't done it. Um, so I think it's 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 worthwhile thinking about, but I'm not sure what we would give you. I mean, um, it, it, I would find it more likely that. Uh, whatever happens, so suppose you want to use the, you know, the, the extremal surface formula, uh, that that should coin that the prescription at, with the one over n corrections or uh, one over lambda corrections should accommodate or should be consistent with the, you know, quantum extremal surface. Now, but that, that, that's just a, well, okay. Um, that's a 
that, that would be the, but that had better happen in context of holography. The question is what independent handles do we already have in, in, in doing this construction? So at, at this point, I don't, I don't see having sort of independent handles to get something distinct in the first place, but I haven't thought about it very much. Or... Okay, thanks. Okay, great. I, I know Juan uh, Pedraza has another question. However, um, uh, he agreed to, to ask it uh, off the recording so we can uh, finish the official part now. And um, thank you again, Veronica. Thank you everyone for the questions and for the lively discussion. Um, I, I would, uh, I'm, I'm happy to see you all next week. So let's finish the fin uh, official part now. Thank you. Uh, I think Martin, yeah, Martin, you have to uh, switch it off.